So I don't really have a place for you to turn in your Bible because we have a topic to discuss today. Um, I don't even know, where am I opening my Bible to? I don't know. All right, so uh, let's, uh, give you, let me give you the title of the message, The Christian and Media, Part 1. The Fundamentals of Sanctification is the subtitle. So last week we answered a question about why immorality is more damaging than other sins. This week we're going to turn to a question that is somewhat related, or perhaps the previous question is a subset of this question, really. Uh, but here's the question, what should Christians do about media? So how to answer this question? Well, first of all, we have to talk about, define what we're talking about. So according to Merriam-Webster, there's basically two definitions uh, for this. A medium of cultivance, uh, conveyance, or expression. So something, a media, is a conveyance, a mean of, means of expressing itself. It also has the meaning of mass media, or members of the mass media. Right? So we often think of the, uh, the press, the television reporters, and, the, uh, and so forth as mass media. But we mean something more than that today. And so the dictionary goes on and talks about usage. And it says, the singular media and its plural medias seemed to have originated in the field of advertising over 70 years ago. They are apparently still so used without stigma in that specialized field. In most other applications, Media is used as a plural of medium. The great popularity of the word in references to the agencies of mass communication is leading to a formulation of a mass noun construed as a singular. So here's a quote from Ed Meese. There is no basis for it. You know, the news media gets on to something. So he's referring to the news media. And then uh, somebody, uh, I guess a British guy, James Lewis, I don't know who he is. The media is less interested in the party's policies. So there they're talking about reporters and news media, of that sort. So I was looking around for something that would perhaps broaden things out and touch on what we're meaning by this. And I found a site called Techpedia. So you know that that must be authoritative. <clears throat> anyway, so here's what he says. Media is the plural form of medium, which broadly speaking describes any channel of communication. This can include anything from printed paper to digital data and encompasses art, news, educational content, and numerous other forms of information. Anything that can reach or influence people, including phones, television, and the internet, can be considered a form of media. And I think that's where we're getting with this idea, this question about the Christian and media. What should the Christian do about media, about the means of communication that are out there. And there are actually um, uh, quite a bit. Uh, oh, there's uh, Yvonne's son is here to pick her up. So, so we will let her go. Anyway, but the, um, what should we do about the media? What should we do about the Internet? How should we handle uh, all of these uh, things? How, how should a Christian approach it? Should a Christian be uh, completely abstaining from all forms of media or not? Is it possible to, uh, to cut all those things out of your life? I would say our world is awash in media. It's not just the uh, radio, the television, uh, the internet, but it's everywhere there are things being communicated to you. Uh, your shirt can be media. People communicating something to you. They're saying something uh, by the designs and the words that are printed on uh, shirts, for example. And so we're talking about the world that we live in, really, when it comes down to this. We're, and, and another term, a Bible term that we would use to describe sort of the the mass communication, the, all the different sources of information that we have in the world, uh, we could call it the world itself, or worldliness is, is a, another term that we could use, a Bible term that we could use in this. I started looking through my notes and resources on this. It seems that there are 
subjects related to the question that I've taught over the years. In 2010, we had a lengthy Bible study on godliness and worldliness, which certainly touched on this theme. That was 13 years ago. Uh, and I'm sure none of you will remember it, even if you were here and heard it the first time. Some of you, you know, you wouldn't even have been in the church or even uh, in the, uh, certainly not in the adult Bible study time, which is where we were teaching that. So I don't plan on resurrecting that whole series, but I may use some material from its notes, although it's quite a bit of reading. I've got somewhere around 20 or 30 lessons on that subject from back then. So what I want to do today is I want to start laying some foundations. And some of it is material you've heard before. So, and actually quite recently. So the reason we ask the question is the first thing I want to talk about. When somebody becomes a Christian, there is a revolution that happens in your spirit. You are, something has happened to you that has transformed the way you look at the world. It's, the Bible describes it in different ways. It uses the term regeneration. Talks about being, Jesus talked about being born again. Talks about how you have a new spirit within you. And so forth. There's many different ways. So I'm going to share some of the verses that uh, relate to this. So let's start with 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new crea creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. So the new, we have a new way of looking at the world. The old way of looking at the world is gone. Even if you became a Christian as a very young child, there is a difference between you and the people in the world and the things that the world thinks and the way they express themselves and the way they communicate and the things that they communicate about. So there is a difference. So, Ephesians 5.8, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. In the Lord. Walk as children of light. Uh, and so, the, there, there is something about the non-Christian life that is a way of darkness. There's something about the Christian life that is the way of light. Now, the Christian is capable of stepping into the darkness, this verse implies. So, he's exhorting us, walk as children of the light. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 5. You are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night, nor of darkness. So that contrast, again, is made. Here's one that I came across just recently. Romans 6, verses 17 to 18. The, but thanks to be, be to God, that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin... You became slaves of righteousness. Now that's quite an interesting way of saying it. We were slaves of sin. That's the way of the world. Most of the media in the world is dominated by people who are slaves of sin. But we've been fr made free from that. And having been freed from sin, we're still slaves. Slaves of righteousness. So there is something in our spirit as a born-again believer that has made a contrast between me and the world. I am now connected to light, to righteousness. I'm a new creation. All of these images that the Bible uses are true of me. I have a new way of thinking. So because of this change, we sense that the things of the world are alien to our new nature. So I'm going to read a passage. We're going to look at this again a little bit later. But this one, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. All right, so here we are. We have this contrast and we have this sense that there is something out there that is not compatible with my new way of looking at things. And in fact, I'm commanded not to love it. I'm commanded to have a different stance towards it. 
So here's where I'm getting with this. The reason we ask the question, by asking the question, what should Christians do about media, we are standing, the question stands on a premise or a proposition. There is something wrong with the world's media to some extent. All right, now, people will talk about the image of God. You look at the creativity of man. You see the things that men have developed. One area that this is quite evident, the development of this, is in the movie industry. You look back, I think it was Thomas Edison who created the first moving picture camera, uh, if I recall correctly. And you look at back at some of the films that he took. They aren't very riveting, I'll have to say. They're interesting because they're the first ones. They aren't very riveting. So then if you go and transfer through time, that was in the 1800s, you transfer through time to now, and you look at the films that people produce, and they're just with the special effects, the filming of it, or the digitizing of it, or whatever it is they're doing, they're not actually using film anymore. The, the, the show is sort of mind-boggling, especially when you consider the difference. And why is it that men get better and better at making moving pictures? Because of the image of God. Now, the, the image of God creates things. Even the idea of giving a moving picture, that was the image of God expressing itself in the world. So we will say, okay, the world is actually doing something in connection with the creation mandate. God said, you know, rule the world and be creative and live out the image of God. Well, that's what's happening. Except they are of darkness. They don't walk in the light. They are the old creature, not the new creature. They're not born again. They do love the world. All right? So there is, there is darkness in their creativity. So yes, the image of God can be seen, but there is something the Christian, when he asks the question, what should Christians do about media? There's something the Christian instinctively understands. It's not all right. There's something there that means that as a Christian, I have to discern, right? I can't just say, okay, Here's a guy being creative, and I can enjoy his creativity. Okay? We can't just say anything goes. There's, we quite clearly know that. All right, so I want to do now is to do something I'm calling recalling the fundamentals of sanctification. Now, some of you were here. Uh, some of you aren't able to come on Wednesday nights, but some months ago in November, we were in Second Peter, and I gave a message on the fundamentals of sanctification. And so some of you may not have seen this, and others uh, might remember it. It was, I think it was a pretty important message. So it was one, it stuck with me quite a bit. I've been thinking about it quite a bit. I don't remember all of my own messages, I have to say. They, you know, you say them once and it's over, and if you, oh, what did you preach on last week? I don't know, I have to go look it up. <laughs> you know, I just don't remember uh, quite often. But this particular one, I have not only... Um, thought about it quite a bit. I wrote a subsequent article and posted it on Proclaim and Defend and then a follow-up article because I think this is a really important issue for Christians and for them to think about how they look at the world. Well, the thing is that this came up This came up in, in, as we were thinking about that list in uh, Second Peter. So I'm going to put the, the chart on the screen. So we've got all these passages. So we've got 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, Galatians 5, 22 to 23, James 3, 17 to 18, Philippians 4, 8. All right, so there are some things about this that Christians, the basic premise is this, as I've already said previously as, uh, you know, in the previous uh, comments, some things about sanctification that Christians automatically understand. If you're born again, you automatically understand. There's something in the world that is part that has darkness in it and I have to be careful I need discernment uh, and even Christians who don't turn very far away from the world realize that this is true right they will make they will say well 
you say, well, what about this? What about this? Well, I wouldn't go that far, they'll say, okay, because they, they know that's, that's too far. That's darkness. Okay, I wouldn't go that far, but you're too narrow. They'll look at me. You're too narrow. Well, whether I'm too narrow or not is not the issue. The issue is, the bottom line idea of sanctification is, there are some things that the Spirit of God approves and some things that it condemns. And so we need to, and this is something we naturally understand as Christians. All right, so let's look at our list here. Okay, so we have, the, these are the virtue lists. So 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. Now this, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, the King James calls that virtue, in your moral excellence, knowledge, your knowledge, self-control, your self-control, perseverance, your perseverance, godliness, in your brotherly, in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. So these are all positive qualities of the Spirit. We see in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. Galatians 5, 22, very similar, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. So again, we have that very uh, clear presentation. Then uh, James 3, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we understand this is, these are all parallel passages. Uh, Philippians, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. King James says, think on these things. Set your mind on these things. So we, as Christians, we want to pursue the fruit of the Spirit. We want to pursue the Wisdom from above. We want to think on the things that we're instructed to. We want to add them to our faith, you see. So it's all, it's a universal testimony in the New Testament. It's something that the Spirit instructs our hearts immediately. You're born again, you already have this sense. Even a little child who's born again knows there are some things he shouldn't do. And he can, he can be led to understand what's right, what's light. You know, if he's a born again child, a child can. I don't think you should pressure a child to be born again, but a born again child can see these things. All right, but we also have the opposites, and that's the vice lists. Some of them are right next to each other, and the next thing I'm going to do is lay them all out next to each other. James talks about, he says, if you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant, and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist there is disorder and every evil thing now in the ma the manifold uh, creativity and expertise of Hollywood do you ever see jealousy and selfish ambition expressed I mean I we had a professor who'd say I speak as a fool of course you do <laughs> of course you do right you see that you see, you see uh, all of these things. This, and he says, this is wisdom from below. It's earthly. It's natural. It's demonic. That's the darkness. That's the old way. Now, Galatians 5, the deeds of the flesh are evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Right? of which I have forewarned you, just I ha as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So very explicit. 1 Peter 2, 1, Therefore putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. So you, you see, those things are put off. Second, or 1 John 2, 15 through 17, which we already read. The lust of the uh, eye, the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. Do we see those things communicated? Do we see them communicated in commercials on television? Do we see them communicated on the internet? Are they a part of the video games that, uh, uh, well, I guess we have to say all of us play. You say, wait a minute, you, you old fogies play? Yeah, we play things like solitaire. All right, we play other stuff. Yes, we're very old and slow. You know, we don't do this, you know, ray gun and shooting up and all this. You know, it's, uh, it's just too much for us. But, all the flashing lights, it's just, you can't handle it.
but, but we all do these things. Are these elements in at least some of the video games? Are there elements of darkness, immorality, sensuality, idolatry? Are they in video games? Well, in some, for sure, we have to say, yes, they are. Yes, they are. So, those are, those are deeds of the flesh. Those are, that's wisdom from below. That's the things of the world, right? Okay, so we, we have to think about these things. There is a contrast. So now what I'd like to do is put the passages together. So here's Galatian, the works of the flesh. Here they are. And then on the contrast, but, the very next verse, but the fruit of the Spirit is. So what the Spirit produces is love, joy, peace, patience. Now, people will often say, when it comes to uh, movies, why don't they produce more, what is it, the lowest? Is it G rating? Is that the lowest? General audience? Okay, the family shows. Why don't they produce more of those? They make so much money when they make one of those. Yeah, that one movie makes a lot of money. But if you were to have a steady diet of nothing but that, how many of them would sell? Not many. Because what sells? Violence, immorality, drunkenness, wars. Um, you know, you think of the themes of these movies. It's the conflict that people thrive on. It's the, 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 imp, the bombarding of the senses. If it was all you know, just a wholesome story, we'd get bored. Why? Because that's the way the flesh works. Okay? And so, that's the Galatians passage. Here's the... James passage, if you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, do not be arrogant. This wisdom does not, that which comes from above is empty, earthly, natural, demonic. But then he contrasts, look at the very next. But the wisdom from above is first, pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits. The Peter passages are not right together, but in First Peter we see putting aside all malice and all deceit. And then we see in Second Peter, now for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith supply, or as the King James says, to your faith add. So put aside the malice and deceit and so forth. Add these things into your faith. All right. So that's what Peter is teaching us. Now the next two are from two different authors, so I, but I've contrasted them. Do not love the world, but think, Paul says, but think on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, whatever is good repute. And the, uh, so, the, uh, so those are the contrasts. So now we're going to go and give you some concluding observations for today, and that will finish up our study today. So I spent most of my time on the scriptures here. And why do I do that? Well, to underscore the dichotomy between the Christian and the world or the flesh. Right? So we are, we, are, we are new creatures. We are now responding to the Holy Spirit of God. So we have to recognize when that conflict is in our hearts, there might be a movie you're watching, there might be a video game you're playing, there might be... A book you're reading, there might be, I don't know what, a piece of art that you're enjoying. It might be whatever, it could be anything. Okay? It has an expression. Some of it maybe reflect great talent in the artist or the person who produced it or whatever. There's a great deal of ability. But, but is it edifying my spirit? There is a difference between... The Christian in the world, and we need to think about it. Christianity isn't about just about being nicer than lost people. That's my next observation. Oftentimes what I find is that Christians tend to want to emphasize the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, etc., etc. We're loving people. 
And they don't want to talk about the works of the flesh. They don't want to cut them out of their lives. They don't want to rebuke them in other people. They don't want to stand up against them when it's a public issue. They want to be nice and well thought of and gentle and kind. Well, we are to be gentle and kind, and there is a right way and a wrong way to stand up against evil, but Christianity isn't just about being nicer about uh, than other people, although, I put it in the notes, we should be nice. Okay. Christianity involves making decisions about the things of the world. Can we deny that media are infected by worldly attitudes and values? Well, uh, the answer to that is no. We can't deny that. Now, specifically here, so let's look at one aspect of media. Does music in our world exalt selfishness, jealousy, and rebellion, or does it glorify God? Okay, now, I, I want to be careful when we pose a close question like that. Are we making a false dichotomy? A false dichotomy lays out two choices. It says it's either or. All right, but when we look at music in our world, most of the world's music, what is it exalting? Selfishness, jealousy, rebellion, or glorifying God? Well, we're pretty sure it's not glorifying God. There's other things we could add in there. I just threw three, three terms. Listen to country music, and it seems it's all jealousy and anger and whining and crying and moaning and so forth. I don't want to just pick on country music. It's, there's, those themes are in all sorts of music, right? Or on the internet, do we find anger and immorality and drunkenness and jealousy and envying? At least in some elements of the things that are expressed. When people thrive on the conflict, what do you see people posting on, in uh, online forums? They're posting about the latest outrage, and we should be outraged about some of these things. But hmm, how much should we pursue our outrage? when we have nothing to do with it and can't solve it, we're outside of it. We have no way of protesting it. If there is a way to protest it, then protest it to the people whom you need to protest it to. And what about video games? Same kind of categories. Or any of the arts of man. man. Movies, books, painting, sculpture, podcasts, <laughs> which I like to listen to. Not all of them, okay? Uh, but, I, you know... Some of them I just said, nah, I'm tired of those guys. They're, they're lost. Listen to some of these political commentators. Okay, so they tend, I tend to listen to people I agree with in politics. I don't really care about those I disagree with because they just make me mad. And I don't want to listen to them. All right? But those that I agree with, basically, most of them are lost people. You listen to them long enough and you're going to find... You know, there's something wrong with the way they look at politics, even though they look at it the same way I do. They're the world, the darkness is in their thinking. Okay? Since the world infects everything that man produces, Christians will have to make a decision to stop consuming media at some point. At some point. So we haven't come to an answer to the question. We're basically, what we're basically saying is, good question, come back for more next week. All right? That's basically what the, we're at so far. We're just posing some groundwork. We want to lay some Bible foundations here. We, there, there is this conflict between us and the world. So how do we navigate it? We're not just saying, you know, we could say, okay, we're going we're gonna to have a Christian commune. We're going to be totally... Uh, separate from the world, we're going to raise our own vegetables and, you know, whatever, and raise our own cows and, you know, and live off the land. And, well, that's not really practical. It wouldn't work. Okay? And uh, people who've tried it have had, they, the problem is they bring the world in their hearts with them. Okay? So what we need to understand is how to live in the Spirit in a world that is full of darkness. That's really what it gets down to. So come back next week for more. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, as we think about this topic, we pray that you'll help us to be really thinking biblically and to be letting the Bible guide our decision-making and our thinking. Lord, this week we're just looking at a foundation. 
Help us to be resting on the Word of God as our foundation for everything that we think about how to navigate our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.